it's, it's been lovely coming to Kiel again and this, the rhythm of the last four summers has been I think four summers ago I first met Neil and we sat in the refectory over the summer uh, chatting about his life and so on and people kept passing by, everybody knew him, that was the first thing and everybody was friendly to him and the third thing was Neil introduced me at the time as this is the BBC, he's doing my life story and nobody seemed surprised. That was that was my first thing. So that so I, I noticed then what a friendly and you know a campus it was, and everybody seemed to know everybody else. And then this uh, two summers ago, Neil got his honorary degree, so we we're here for that. And last summer we were here filming. So I feel every you know it's obviously that my destination of choice for a midsummer break, and. Um, you know, I always find it an incredibly welcoming place. It's lovely to be back and, you know, it's a great honour and a, a, a privilege to be back for, for an honorary degree. I, I know Stoke vaguely, but the last few times I visited Stoke before the filming, I was wearing a Manchester United scarf, so people were less friendly, I think. And they, uh, but with the, it always sounds a cliche, but the, this was generally true, the openness and the friendliness and a kind of genuine interest. I mean, I've, you know, I've been writing for 24 years now, so I've been and visited a fair few cities where you come in with a film crew and it's a bit of a pain and you stop blocking off streets. And people were genuinely enthusiastic. There wasn't the, you know, in, we were in one city once and a guy got his TV license and started waving it in protest at our presence. People were and also genuinely excited for the area that, you know, that, that, that something was happening that, uh, was reflecting the area. I, I, I mean, it, you know, even people in Stoke will tell you, you know, it's a hard city initially to get your head round because it's the five towns and, and has no discernible centre and so on. But what we found was that people were very open, very cooperative, couldn't do enough, and uh, just the, the, you start to get a sense of the sort of distinct areas and everything. I, I, I mean, I saw a lot of it through Neil's eyes. And so everybody here seems quite pleased to see Neil, so maybe that's a false impression. And also the countryside around here is beautiful, and I've never seen that. And I grew up in Stockport. We, I don't think we ever we used to go to Stoke for the day for the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, um, I taught children with learning disabilities for, for 14 years before the, the, the writing took off. And, and in my writing, I've, I wrote a thing called Flesh and Blood uh, a few years ago uh, with a theme of learning disability, if you like. I don't like issue dramas as such. It's got to be a drama first and foremost. And the thing was with Neil, it was actually my wife, Kate, who read the article. And she said, and I don't normally do that. I don't like to find a story in a newspaper, turn it into a drama approach. And um, it was the opening sentence. I think the opening sentence was something like, Aged 18, Neil Baldwin, a young man with learning difficulties, went to Keel University and he hasn't left. And I thought, well that's interesting, and I was reading it down, and then the Stoke City thing. And I thought, the combination of three communities, students, football fans, and the circus, none of which you would normally associate with being necessarily altruistic and supportive, could be shown in this really good and supportive light. I'm, in fairness, I'm leaving the church out of that because they probably do have a reputation of altruism. I also like the fact that the point where the church, Stoke City, Keele University and the circus intersect seemed a good point to place drama. So as a dramatist, as purely selfish point of view, as a dramatist, I thought there's material here. Now you never know if there's a story, that's a different thing, a narrative. And uh, I, the first time I met Neil, I liked him and we got on. I was, still wasn't sure what the drama could be. Mm. Um, and that was, but then I was watching Neil and I thought he's such a natural performer. The idea came into my head of having the real Neil talking to the actor Neil. Very, very early on, I thought he's got to be in it. He can't play himself, but there's something about his quality that we have to have on the screen. And it kind of built from there. I think with Neil, he, he, I mean, Lou Macari said he's got no side, and I think that's right. He's, he, he meets life pretty much head on. Um, you know, everybody who knows Neil, you know, knows he can, be, you know, he can be demanding, and that's fine. But 
it's demanding in such a way that you always end up doing the thing he wants you to do anyway. So I think he's got, I always leave Neil's company happier. I think he's got a very straightforward attitude, but it's his, his sense of humour and his open-mindedness is a, a very attractive qualities. Um, and I'll just, there's one anecdote that illustrates this. When I was struggling to find what the story of Marvellous might be, I said to him, let's go back to the beginning. On the first day you've met the first student at Kiel, who did they think you were? And he looked at me in half smile and he said, well, I may have been wearing a dog collar. <laughs> and it was in the word may. <laughs> well, you either are or you are. I mean, that's not an easy thing. And I just thought, ah, well, what's also interesting about Neil is not, it's not like he's a wholly innocent. He's got an angle and he's working. And that, dramatically, and also as a human being, it makes him transcend that kind of definition, old, you know, there's this chap on the campus. And, all. and so I think that, you know, those combinations. But I think humour, incredibly positive outlook, best networker I've ever met. I'm thinking of sacking my agent and just hiring Neil. It's more work than me anyway now. <laughs>
I couldn't not write. Uh, I wanted it to be published, but I can honestly say if nobody wants to work with me tomorrow, I would carry on writing. It's how I make sense of the world. Uh, and I went on the, I was offered a promotion at work and I thought, oh, this is serious now because this means I will be a teacher and that is fine and that's what I'll do. Deep down, what I really want to do is write. I'll have one more go and I applied for the MA in Creative Writing at UEA. And I got on as a novelist. And by Christmas, and I'd remortgaged my house in Leeds to pay the fees. And by Christmas, I thought, oh, I came on as a teacher. I'm just going to leave as a teacher in death. I can't... It, I love contemporary fiction, but I couldn't see what it was that I was doing that was working. And another student, and I think this is an incredibly important thing about student experience, it was another student who spotted something in my writing and said, you're on the wrong course. You're a screenwriter. You're a playwright. You're not a novelist. He said, you tell all your story through dialogue and you don't give a shit about description. That's where you're going wrong. And I transferred course at Christmas, and it was like coming home. And I'd never attempted to write a television play before then. But I understood, partly because obviously I spent a lot longer watching television as a child as I did reading the classics. I understood it wasn't brilliant, but I understood how the form worked, and I understood how I might be able to do it. And then I got encouragement, and I, a couple of visiting writers came on the course and sat in on workshops. One of them said, oh, I quite like that. Will you send it me when it's finished? Mm -hmm. Then he passed it on to Sally Head at Granada, who was making uh, Prime Suspects and so on at the time. And then at the same time, I think somebody at Casualty, it was a script editor who was two jobs away from the Casualty job. And this is another big message. If you have a relationship with somebody who's a script editor, they will move shows. And usually that's to your advantage, mm -hmm. because if you get a script editor quite early in their career, she ended up being the senior script editor on Casualty two years later and had remembered my script and rang me up. And I was literally going down to sign on when the call came. And I couldn't work out if she was saying they're going to pay me or not. Because she says, would you like to have a go at writing a casualty script? And in the end, I had to say that rather tentative thing. Will there be any money involved? She said, no, yes, I'm commissioning you, you idiot. Um, and I'd got an agent just got an agent by then as well. So that, it was the UEA course, but I feel a real apprenticeship was writing when I had nobody to read it and writing when I wasn't being paid for it. Do you get, or was anything in your speech this morning that um, would be relevant, especially to media or creative writing students? There isn't right now, but there might be now you've got. Hang on. Um, there isn't. <laughs> I thought I'd make it more general, but so let's do it now. I think I, I think for writing students in particular, you know, one of the reasons you write on the whole is, frankly, because you lack other social skills. So it's always a hard ask. I can see people's faces drop when I talk about things like networking and meeting people and being open. Nobody's expecting you to be like an American pitching something clean. Well, you know, we're all diffident. We don't do that. And when I've pitched in America, it's always been bad when I've tried to do the American version, and it's always been great when I've been kind of diffident in English, going, oh, you won't really like it, well, this about this, or something like that. Um, so I would say be open. If somebody says, send me this when it's finished, make sure you're sending them when it's finished. But you don't have to, re they will remember you. People, you know, I remember, you know, the students who I talked to three years ago, and somebody just emailed me a script just the other day. And I remember her, and I remember saying it. So that's genuine. Don't feel that you have to rush around the room getting everybody's cards. If you, if, if, if you have a conversation with somebody and you don't, and you, you don't quite meet, you don't necessarily have to kind of go to that person. Persistence was the thing for me. I know it's an easy thing to say from my position, but I, you know, I was a good, I count it as a, you know, 14 years getting rejection. Deal with your rejection in, in in realistic terms. If the first three people reject you, that might be it's not their taste. If your script's been rejected by 10 people, you might want to be looking at the script. I know everybody has a story of how many times certain things were, were uh, rejected. But I think in the industry, 
if you sent it to 10 good people, and by good people I'm talking the top end independents like Nicola Schindler at Red and Jane Featherstone's Kudos and so on, and they're all people who've read it there are all saying no, then I think you might want to be looking at the work. Mm. Having said that, be strong about your work. No, this is, seems a really obvious point. Know why you're writing it. And I don't mean have an agenda and saying I want to change the world. If it's something about, I'm just fascinated by this drunk who was sitting next to me on the bus and I kind of wanted to interrogate his life, that's fine. You know why you're writing it. So be able to defend your work. And don't worry about offending your family when you've based characters on them, but take the precaution of changing the gender and they never really spot it. Still keep from experience there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, so I think there's a way of doing the networking, which is keep your communication, and I'd also say, don't trust your mate's opinion, they'll either overpraise it or say it's shit. You know, that you, 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 you. but if you can find a connection with a drama students then have a round table read of something and it's excruciating but you'll hear it read out loud and my god that will really really uh, focus you on what dialogue is working and what dialogue isn't mm. and I'm it's I'm still the world's worst at overwriting and I'm still the worst world at I won't leave a joke alone and I'll add something and I was writing Eric and Ernie Victoria, and it was when Victoria Wood finally said, you know if you come out two jokes earlier, it's funnier, don't you? And I thought, well, if Victoria Wood said that she might be right, I'm going to let that go. So it's, it's, those would be the, those would be the, and I think people will see, that's part of the networking, because I think people will see that in you. And then if you can take a note, and take, defend your work by all means, but don't be stroppy, but if you can take a note and adjust the work, that's what they're actually looking for. They're not looking for a perfect script or a perfectly formed writer at the start. They're looking for somebody they can see can respond. And I think that would be the thing. Okay. I, think, um, I think it has brought into its heart. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And, uh, I think it reflects in, incredibly well on the generosity of the student body and the staff body here. I think, there's a, I think there's an atmosphere here that I've really not encountered on other campuses. I think there's an openness. I mean, it's such an institution now that, of course, <laughs> new students are expected to be there. So it's, and I think the first time I met Neil with Patrick, one of his football team was hanging about, and he was, you know, a nice young lad, but just slightly wary of what this might be. These people coming to say they were going to do a film of his life. And then about 20 minutes in, I could see he relaxed. He thought we were genuine. And, we, and I thought, you know, there's not every young person would do that. Somebody was looking out for him. Uh, and he's always found that here. And I think that's incredibly impressive. And at one of Neil's many anniversary stroke birthday parties that seemed largely driven by Neil, I was just standing in a room one of the bars at the Student Union. And in one corner was his friends, his mum's friends from church, who were all easily into their 80s and some of the 90s. The other corner was some Stoke City fans with shirts on. Then the coolest looking African Caribbean lads you've ever seen, a security guard, somebody from the BBC, and a vicar. And I thought, this is the baddest party I've ever been to. And the disco was going, and suddenly we heard somebody, and from somewhere he got a mic and was doing a speech, but he hadn't told. So it was like the worst rap act you'd ever seen. So he could, the DJ didn't always go, so in the back, and they could hear Neil saying, I've had a good life. And, in, and he was pointing to the various areas of his life. And I thought, this is the most bizarre evening of my life. And it's his enduring capacity to create the most bizarre situations. Yet, it seemed absolutely right, and I think it reflects incredibly well on Keel, that they have carried on accommodating these bizarre instances and making it part of the kind of Keel legend, really. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Peter. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys. That was the best interview I've ever had. It was fantastic. <laughs>